and we are back for Overanalyzing House of the Dragon, our series that examines how it came to be that Rhaenyra's Blacks faced off against Aegon's Greens in the Dance of the Dragons. And we have finally made it in Fire and Blood to where House of the Dragon will essentially begin, at the reign of Viserys I. This material was originally published in a story called The Rogue Prince in 2014. Many consider the reign of Viserys I to represent the apex of Targaryen power in Westeros. Beyond a doubt, there were more lords and princes claiming the blood of the dragon than at any period before or since. Though the Targaryens had continued their traditional practice of marrying brother to sister, uncle to niece, and cousin to cousin, wherever possible, there had also been important matches outside the royal family, the fruit of which played important roles in the war to come. There were more dragons than ever before as well, and several of the she-dragons were regularly producing clutches of eggs. Not all of the eggs hatched, but many did, and it became customary for the fathers and mothers of newborn princelings to place a dragon's egg in their cradles, following a tradition that Princess Reyna had begun many years before. The children so blessed invariably bonded with the hatchlings to become dragon riders. So, structurally, we have this rather sloppy paragraph, as suddenly we have gone from a chronological telling of history to speaking about Viserys' whole reign in the context of Targaryen history, not to mention the paragraph is a bit repetitive. The beginning of the chapter already talked about how there were too many Targaryens, and the tourney celebrating Jaehaerys' 50th year of rule already said there were too many dragons. And the reason that this paragraph is a little weird is that it was added later, it was not originally part of the Rogue Prince, and our author still seems to be trying to transition from the newer material on Jaehaerys to the older material on Viserys. So another interesting thing on this paragraph is that it boldly claims that Viserys was the apex of Targaryen power, which implies that Gildane is writing during the reign of Robert or later. Originally our author wanted Gildane to live earlier, as our author did not want to reveal secrets about Summerhall, but this was shifted to be later on when Fire and Blood was split in two. Now, the paragraph claims that there are more princes claiming Targaryen blood than ever before. While this is definitely not true at the beginning of Viserys' reign, when the lords and princes were only Daemon and Laenor, and technically Laenor was never a lord, it does become true later on. Though the number of princes only reaches around 11 at its height. Daemon, Jace, Luke, Joffrey, Aegon II, Aemon, Daron, Jaehaerys, Maelor, Aegon III, and Viserys II. And in the paragraph, our author claims that Targaryen marriages happened that were brother to sister, uncle to niece, and cousin to cousin. And I will say that this is a bit of moving the goalposts on Targaryen incest. So back when just the original series existed, our author had a bit of a contradiction. He went and claimed that Targaryens married brother to sister, and Daenerys expected to marry Viserys, but early on in the series, he only mentioned four incestuous kings in 300 years of Targaryen history. Aegon the Conqueror, Jaehaerys, Aegon the Unworthy, and Aerys the Mad King. And so later on, our author started filling in the history with the World of Ice and Fire, and he added more brother and sisters along with brother and sister marriages. But he also retconned things by claiming that cousin-cousin marriages and uncle-to-niece marriages were part of that Targaryen tradition. Of course, in history, cousin-to-cousin -cousin marriage was extremely common and is still common in much of the world today, and uncle-to-niece marriage was not usually taboo in the Middle Ages but our author needs to make his history fit. Then we hear about the dragons. Now again, at the start of this period, there are not that many dragons. Nine. And only three being ridden. There's Vagar by Lena, Melis by Rhaenys, and Caraxes by Daemon. Vermithor, Silverwing, Dreamfire, and Cannibal are not being ridden, and we have a couple of hatchlings, Laenor's Sea Smoke and Rhaenyra's Cyrax. However, when the Dance of the Dragons begins, the number grows to around 20. So it's safe to say that something has changed. The Targaryens had a small group of dragons for about 200 years, and now that number is exploding. So our author mentions that several she-dragons are laying clutches of eggs during this period. Now, we don't actually know if dragons have sexes, male or female, but my assumption is that once a dragon lays eggs, it becomes classified as a she-dragon. Now, what's interesting is that historically we know that Vagar, Dreamfire, Melis, and Cyrax were all called she-dragons, and each of these dragons' first riders were women. However, Tessarion is later called a she-dragon, and her first rider is Daron, a man. So, maybe the sex of the rider is not important. Also, cradle eggs are mentioned as a Targaryen tradition, which is extremely odd as, yes, Dreamfire Reyna, according to legend, placed eggs in the cradles of Jaehaerys and Alysanne. 
but we don't hear anything about anyone hatching or being bound to a cradle egg for 60 years. Not until the egg that is placed with Lenor Valarian hatches into sea smoke. Keep in mind, Aemon and later Daemon claim Caraxes in the Dragon Pit specifically because he was the fiercest of the dragons available. There is no mention of any cradle bond. And later, Alyssa and Rhaenys the Queen Who Never Was claim Melis from the Dragon Pit specifically because she was swift. Again, no mention of any previous bond. And other than Caraxes and Melis, we don't have any new dragons until Sea Smoke. Now, we don't really know if this cradle egg tradition actually went on, but if it did, we're talking about 17 Targaryens who failed to hatch cradle eggs over a period of 60 years. Oh, for 17. Which is astounding as once Laenor comes along and hatches Sea Smoke, things change quite a bit. Starting with Laenor and Sea Smoke, and ending with the Dance of the Dragons, 12 of 15 Targaryens either hatch cradle eggs or end up with dragons we've never heard of before. We go from 0% to 80%, and then quickly back to 0%. And it's for this reason that I don't actually think that placing eggs in the cradle of a Targaryen is a necessary factor in hatching. Dragons seem to be around without the practice, and the practice had very poor results for 60 years, and poor results after the Dance of the Dragons. There seems to be some other element that is causing dragons to hatch. Something that happened around the birth of Laenor and Rhaenyra, and something that ended at the Dance of the Dragons. Viserys the first Targaryen had a generous and amiable nature, and was well loved by his lords and the small folk alike. The reign of the young king, as the commons called him upon his ascent, was peaceful and prosperous. His grace's open-handedness was legendary, and the Red Keep became a place of song and splendor. King Viserys and Queen Emma hosted many a feast and tourney, and lavished gold, offices, and honors on their favorites. So next we get a first listing of the initial cast of characters in our story. This paragraph tells of Viserys, the next is Rhaenyra, then Otto, then Daemon. The cast is essentially who the important players are between the years 103 and 105 at court. Note that Emma Arryn gets next to nothing written about her. The abused woman is a mere footnote in history, essentially a character who exists to birth a child and then promptly die. Now, as I said, this first paragraph is on Viserys, who is, more or less, a stand-in for Robert Baratheon. He's very generous, though let's remember that he's paying back many people for their votes at the Council of 101, and he's a lover of feasts and tourneys, and later we find out that he is fat, a man with a hot temper, and a man who uselessly commands people to make up. Like Robert, Viserys is definitely a person who doesn't really want to rule, and whose death brings about war. And throughout the rest of the story, it's actually quite striking how little Viserys, the actual king, is mentioned during his 30-year rule. Though one big reason for this is that the source material wasn't originally designed to be about him. It was about Daemon, Rhaenyra, and Alicent. When we actually examine Viserys as a man, we see a dark, sad life. He married and impregnated a child, to help him secure a throne that he doesn't seem to actually want, and then was perhaps cheating on his wife before she died, and then when she did die, he quickly became an alcoholic and married a new woman who was clearly manipulating him. At the center of the merriment, cherished and adored by all, was their only surviving child, Princess Rhaenyra, the little girl the court singers dubbed the Realm's Delight. Though only six when her father came to the Iron Throne, Rhaenyra Targaryen was a precocious child, bright and bold and beautiful, as only one of dragon's blood can be beautiful. At seven, she became a dragon rider, taking to the sky. On the young dragon, she named Cyrax, after a goddess of old Valyria. At eight, the princess was placed into service as a cupbearer, but for her own father, the king. At table, at tourney, and at court, King Viserys thereafter was seldom seen without his daughter by his side. So next we hear about Rhaenyra, the realm's delight, which actually is not much of a compliment when the compliment is coming from paid court singers. We are told that Rhaenyra is bold, intelligent, and beautiful, and a dragon rider at age seven. Seven would make Rhaenyra the youngest dragon rider that we know about in history, and the age of seven is likely referenced to George R. R. Martin's story, The Ice Dragon, where the little girl in that is also a seven-year-old dragon rider. Rhaenyra is a stand-in for Daenerys, the two perhaps causing the rise of dragons, though many parallels between the two characters occur later during the Dance of the Dragons. So Rhaenyra is also a cupbearer for her father at age eight, and there's a bit hidden here in the text. 
We should remember that Emma Aaron dies in 105, the very year that Rhaenyra becomes cupbearer, and we should remember that a cupbearer's duty is to pour drinks, that is wine, and it's said that Viserys is seldom seen without Rhaenyra at this point. The implication here is that the reason Viserys is never seen without his daughter is that he's always drinking and in need of someone to pour his wine. Viserys appears to fall into alcoholism after the death of Emma Arryn. I imagine he mourns the death of his wife, but there is also probably feelings of guilt here as the maesters attribute Emma's poor health to her initial pregnancies when she was 12 or so. And perhaps Viserys feels guilty if he was in fact cheating on her. And perhaps his new wife Alicent and his brother Damon make him want to drink. Meanwhile, the tedium of rule was left largely to the king's small council and his hand. Sir Otto Hightower had continued in that office, serving the grandson as he had the grandsire. An able man, all agreed, though many found him proud, brusque, and haughty. The longer he served, the more imperious Sir Otto became, it was said, and many great lords and princes came to resent his manner and envy him his access to the Iron Throne. So next we hear of Sir Otto Hightower, the Hand of the King, a stand-in for both John Aaron, who does the grunt work for Robert, and Tywin Lannister, who provides the service for Ares. The Tywin parallel is the stronger one, though, as Tywin was resented for his position, and like Otto, his goal was to try to marry his daughter into the royal family. Now, I will say there is a bit of a contradiction on Otto Hightower's character. Here in Fire and Blood, he's called an able man, but in the main story, Maester Pylos calls Otto learned, but a failure. That said, it's actually a bit difficult to pin down how exactly he was a failure. Is Pylos blaming not preventing the Dance of the Dragons on Otto? And if he is, it's odd that the text repeatedly says that the Dance of the Dragons was inevitable. If one were really going to blame someone for the war, besides the Maesters, it would be Kristen Cole, the Kingmaker, and not really Otto Hightower unless he was doing something off-page. Fire and Blood also states that Otto became more imperious over time, which doesn't match the later text. It's in the beginning of Otto's rule, where he commands Viserys to appoint and dismiss people on the small council, and tries to get Viserys to change his heir, but later on the text is really silent on Otto's actions until the war, and during the war he's often overruled and described as too prudent. If I had to reconcile the contradictions, I would say that the paragraph is a bit poorly worded and makes more sense in the context of the original material, The Rogue Prince. In the context of a self-contained story, one that revolves around Daemon, Otto is really only relevant as a foil to Daemon, the main character. So this introduction is really just about Otto's personality during those first few years at court, when Otto and Daemon were both there, which is actually only 103 to 105. Daemon leaves court in 105 and Otto in 109. Otto returns in 120, but Daemon's not there. This is similar to Rhaenyra being described as a character that everyone loves, the realm's delight. It only applies to those first few years. The greatest of his rivals was Daemon Targaryen, the king's ambitious, impetuous, moody younger brother. As charming as he was hot-tempered, Prince Daemon had earned his knight's spurs at six and ten, and had been given dark sister by the old king himself in recognition of his prowess. Though he had wed the Lady of Runestone in 97 during the old king's reign, the marriage had not been a success. Prince Daemon found the Vale of Arryn boring. In the Vale, the men fuck sheep, he wrote. You cannot fault them. Their sheep are prettier than their women. And soon developed a mislike of his lady wife, whom he called My Bronze Bitch, after the runic bronze armor worn by the lords of House Royce. Upon the ascension of his brother to the Iron Throne, the prince petitioned to have his marriage set aside. Viserys denied the request, but did allow Daemon to return to court, where he sat on the small council, serving as Master of Coin from 103 to 104, and Master of Laws for half a year in 104. And next we have our introduction to Daemon Targaryen, the Rogue Prince. Now, so much is written on him as opposed to everyone else because this was originally his story, The Rogue Prince. This paragraph has been altered slightly from the source material, removing the phrase, Our Rogue Prince, from the first sentence, while adding the description, Moody. 
Now, Daemon Targaryen is a stand-in for Oberyn Martell. He's an intelligent, unpredictable, cruel character who likes to indulge in all of the pleasures of life. He comes to court to be on the small council, grows bored easily, and goes off to have adventures in the world, usually through fighting. However, Maester Gildane shows his bias against Daemon in how he presents his estrangement from Rhea Royce of the Vale. Keep in mind, the marriage of Daemon to Rhea was one of political necessity. Balon and Viserys needed the Vale to support them over Rhaenys, and the marriages of Viserys to Emma Arryn and Daemon to Rhea Royce were tools for this support. So Daemon has no reason to like Rhea Royce and is getting nothing further politically out of their marriage. Viserys has already ascended the throne, and Rhea has provided him no children. Additionally, Rhea perhaps has been coded as a lesbian with her wearing of bronze armor, despite the family tradition and the existence of Brienne wearing armor. Whatever the case, Daemon is in a bad situation. Yet look at how Gildane frames him unsympathetically. He claims that Daemon simply found the Vale of Arryn boring. That is most certainly not the problem. Daemon does not like his wife and has received no heir in six years. In fact, we have no idea if Rhea is even young enough to have children anymore. The fact that her father has passed implies that she may be on the old side. Additionally, look at the placement of the joke, in the Vale the men fuck sheep, the sheep are prettier than the women. How does this relate to Damon being bored? The placement of the joke makes it seem like Damon is the one seeking extramarital sex but can't find it. Yet we don't really have any evidence of this as Damon is not at court. Now, Damon requesting a divorce or an annulment of his marriage is a rather striking request as it relates to a potential child of Rhaegar and Lyanna. We know that unconsummated marriages can perhaps be set aside by the High Septon, but consummated marriages are rather set in stone in Westeros. Here is an actual case where a Targaryen tried to have a marriage set aside and was refused. Viserys, at the supposed height of political power for the Targaryens, did not think he could go against the Faith of the Seven on this issue. And so it seems unlikely that Rhaegar and King Aerys would be able to. Governance bored his warrior prince, however. He did better when King Viserys made him commander of the City Watch. Finding the watchmen ill-armed and clad in oddments and rags, Daemon equipped each man with dirk, short sword, and cudgel, armored them in black ringmail with breastplate for the officers, and gave them long golden cloaks that they might wear with pride. Ever since, the men of the City Watch have been known as Gold Cloaks. So next we hear about Daemon becoming the leader of the Gold Cloaks, with him even giving them their name. Now, the importance of the Gold Cloaks' loyalty is, of course, a reference to Ned's failed coup in A Game of Thrones, with Littlefinger's funding and Janos Slint's command being essential in securing their loyalty for Joffrey. Having many in the Gold Cloaks be loyal to Daemon is a seed for events that will happen 25 years in the future, during the Dance of the Dragons, when the Gold Cloaks betray the Green Faction and support Rhaenyra and the Blacks. It's a little unrealistic, but this is a fantasy story. Prince Daemon took eagerly to the work of the Gold Cloaks and oft prowled the alleys of King's Landing with his men. That he made the city more orderly, no man could doubt, but his discipline was a brutal one. He delighted in cutting off the hands of pickpockets, gelding rapists, and slitting the noses of thieves, and slew three men in street brawls during his first year as commander. Before long, the prince was well known in all the low places of King's Landing. He became a familiar sight in wine sinks, where he drank for free, and gambling pits, where he always left with more coin than when he entered. Though he sampled countless whores in the city's brothel, and was said to have an especial fondness for deflowering maidens, a certain Lycene dancing girl soon became his favorite. Missaria was the name she went by, though her rivals and enemies called her Misery, the White Worm. Next, we get a rather detailed description of Damon's character and actions as the head of the Gold Cloaks. However, this is a good time to keep in mind the sources and the bias. Again, Gildane is a maester, piecing together the writings of a different maester, a septon, and a court fool. Would any of these people really know about Damon's behavior? How do they know he was chopping off limbs and killing people in the streets? And how do they know he was delighting in it? How do they know he was receiving bribes, visiting brothels? somehow finding and deflowering maidens. Now, maybe this information is true, and maybe it's not, and yes, Damon was definitely being spied on by someone, but it seems to go against the characterization of Damon as a loved brother to Viserys and an admired uncle of a little girl, Rhaenyra. And we, of course, are supposed to think of the many untrue tales of Tyrion as Hand, 
or of Danny in Slaver's Bay. The bias is most notable when describing Masaria, a stand-in for Melisandre and Bloodraven. Masaria is a dancer, but she's lumped in with talk of brothels, which makes it appear like she is also a sex worker. And then Gildane colors us with her nickname given to her by her enemies. We really know nothing about Masaria, but our opinion now is being influenced by the idea that she's a prostitute and a worm. As King Viserys had no living son, Daemon regarded himself as the rightful heir to the Iron Throne and coveted the title Prince of Dragonstone, which his grace refused to grant him. But by the end of year 105 AC, he was known to his friends as the Prince of the City and to the small folk as Lord Flea Bottom. Though the king did not wish Daemon to succeed him, he remained fond of his younger brother and was quick to forgive his many offenses. And now we are back with the almost farcical level of bias from Maester Gildane. So here Daemon is made to look like the unreasonable one. How dare he wish to be named heir over Rhaenyra, Viserys' daughter. Gildane even throws shade on Daemon by bringing up the nickname Lord Flea Bottom, a mocking name similar to Lord Snow. Except Gildane just spent pages and pages trying to convince us that excluding women was the right way to go with succession. Rhaenys was passed over for Balon, and then Rhaenys was passed over for Viserys. Gildane just said five pages back that many thought the Council of 101 was an iron precedent that the Iron Throne could not pass to women. In this context, Daemon's request is actually quite reasonable, especially considering that Daemon married a barren woman who he didn't like to help Viserys take the throne, and more importantly, it is his dragon Caraxes that is Viserys' only real defense against Rhaenys' Maelys and Lena's Vagar. Considering that Daemon is the dragon rider, Viserys denying Daemon the status of heir is quite bold. Princess Rhaenyra was also enamored of her uncle, for Daemon was ever attentive to her. Whenever he crossed the narrow sea upon his dragon, he brought her some exotic gift of his return. The king had grown soft and plump over the years, Viserys never claimed another dragon after Balerion's death, nor did he have much taste for the joust, the hunt, or swordplay, whereas Prince Daemon excelled in these spheres, and seemed all that his brother was not, lean and hard, a renowned warrior, dashing, daring, more than a little dangerous. And so here Gildane mentions the relationship between Rhaenyra and Daemon, trying to add romance to the story to make it more interesting. There are no fewer than four romantic interests for Rhaenyra over her life, with the implication that the Dance of the Dragons was largely started because of the breakdown of her relationship with Kristen Cole, and that her downfall was due to the breakdown of her relationship with Daemon Targaryen. Rhaenyra and Daemon do eventually wed, though we are not sure if there was any actual romantic feelings between the two, or if this was a political move. Now the paragraph once again makes Daemon look like the adventurous Oberyn Martell, with Daemon spending time in Essos. It is a mystery what Daemon was actually doing there during this period. Daemon never secures any alliances with anyone in the Free Cities that we know about. I suppose it was just tourism. We are also briefly told that Viserys never claims another dragon after the death of Balerion the Black Dread. Viserys being dragonless was likely a very important factor in him being chosen as king over Rhaenys and Laenor at the Council of 101. In all of Targaryen history, Viserys is the only Targaryen proven to outlive his dragon. There are rumors about Rhaenys the Conqueror, but she's never around another dragon, so it doesn't really matter. And so the fact that Viserys never rides again is interesting. Can dragon riders bond a second time? The implication with Viserys is no. But we also get this notion that Viserys is lazy, and so it's possible that he simply never tried again. And this is a good place to stop. We will continue on in part 8 with a discussion of the sources that Archmaester Gildane takes from. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.